Hello, first tonight, justice for the family of Dinah McNichol, 18 years after she went missing. She disappeared in 1991. She'd been to a music festival in Hampshire and was last seen hitching a lift home to Essex. What happened after that remained a mystery for years. Today, Peter Tobin was found guilty of her murder. The details now from Gareth George in Chelmsford. Well, Peter Tobin is officially a serial killer. His victims, Angelica Kluck, Vicky Hamilton. But the trial that's been taking place here was all about a young woman from Essex, a young woman called Dinah McNichol. She vanished in 1991 and she'd fallen into the hands of Peter Tobin. The McNichol family had waited 18 years to make a statement like this. After all these years, we at last know the truth and justice has prevailed. We would like to offer our condolences and sympathy to the families of his other victims. We would now like to put the trial behind us and remember Dinah as a unique and inspiring daughter, sister, niece, auntie and friend that she was. Dinah McNichol disappeared in 1991, hitchhiking home from a music festival in Hampshire. In court one at Chelmsford Crown Court today, Peter Tobin, a serial killer, was convicted of her murder. Peter Tobin, I can only describe as pure evil. He's shown no remorse for killing Dinah or any other girls he's been convicted of killing. Still now denying any involvement in her death. 16 years after she disappeared, Dinah's body was discovered in the garden of a house in Margate where Tobin once lived. Dinah's body lay close to that of Vicky Hamilton, another of Tobin's teenage victims. Vicky's father was also in court today. Tobin's defence was being handled by a QC called Oliver Blunt, but earlier today he told the judge, on behalf of Peter Tobin, we have no evidence to offer. And it took the jury less than 15 minutes to find Tobin guilty. Police fear Tobin may have carried out other crimes, and today the officer leading that investigation said Tobin was a cruel man. To put a family through what he has done, and this is twice. The trial started in June, and it's back on this now. Sitting there, putting them through, listening to the harrowing details of what he did to her. Horrendous, absolutely horrendous. A band played this lament for Dinah at a memorial service held last year in her home village of Tillingham. Her friends and family gathered to remember a young woman who loved music, a young woman described as outgoing, generous and kind-hearted. Her disappearance left Dinah's father facing years of heartache. Today's verdict may finally bring him closure. Well, serial killers seem to be things of cop shows or Hollywood films. It's still hard to believe there's been one on trial here at Chelmsford Crown Court and a serial killer whose tentacles stretched as far as rural Essex. Very shortly after he was found guilty, Peter Tobin was sentenced. The sentence was life imprisonment and he was told he would never, ever be released from jail. Today is a day the McNichol family have waited 18 years for. Gareth, thank you very much. Well, Milton Keynes moved a step closer today to hosting World Cup football in 2018. First, though, England has to win the bid to host the finals. But the news today puts Stadium MK on the footballing map, one of 12 centres across the country to make the shortlist. A final decision will be made next year. In a moment, club chairman Pete Winkleman. But first, this report from Jonathan Park. Field or they were left to wait until the very end. And last, but in our opinion, certainly not the least. Milton Keynes Stadium, MK. But they celebrated like they'd won the World Cup. The bid team, MK John staff and the fans all there to see Milton Keynes take its place alongside Manchester, Liverpool and London. Football's big three. We've built a city over the last 42 years and we know we can deliver. So, if anything, I think it was the combination of dreams and delivery that did it. I, I, I characterised it this morning in the presentation as low risk and high ambition. 
When England won the World Cup, Milton Keynes didn't exist, so today's news is a real milestone. England's bid team still have to persuade FIFA to give them the 2018 World Cup. D-Day is at the end of next year, but whatever happens, it's a giant step forward for Milton Keynes. We have entered now the top league of English cities. We're on a par with Bristol and Nottingham and places like that, which is enormously important to us. But I also hope that what we will do over the next few years will demonstrate that the days of the roundabouts, remember Noel Edmonds, the roundabouts, the concrete cars, those days are past us. MK's bid doesn't just involve Stadium MK. Ipswich, Norwich, Northampton and Rushton all stand to benefit as training bases. But capacity here will increase from 22,000 to 43,000. Their current crowds in League One are around 11,000. It is a little bit of a frightening scenario to think that we're, we're going to end up as a 45,000, albeit uh, temporary. But hopefully within the next 10 years we can actually progress and the club will progress through the leagues, carry on the way it's doing and build the fan base as it has done year on year. The improvements won't be cheap. The bill for staging the World Cup in MK is around £60 million. That's a lot of money for Don's chairman Pete Winkleman to find, but that's the cost of progress. Last night it was the Johnson's paint trophy. Tonight it's the World Cup. Jonathan Park, BBC Look East. Well, let's talk to club chairman Pete Winkleman, who's in Milton Keynes. £60 million, a lot of money to find, isn't it? It is, Stuart, but um, we've done it before. We're very good at being able to deliver things in Milton Keynes, and we've got an awful lot of development uh, to do over the next 20 years here. And part of the value that we add from that development will go on to delivering the World Cup for Milton Keynes. Why do you think you were successful and other big centres weren't? Well, I've got to tell you, I, I was really proud of the bid that we put in. Um, we started off as, as big outsiders, of course. It's the new city. The football's not very old here, only five years old. Um, but when you looked at the quality of the bid document that went into the FA, it was really good. We've looked at all the things like the fan fests and host city highways. And, of course, we've got a great track record for delivery. Um, and when you put all those things together um, and the political leadership all coming together as well, that really makes a very strong case so I think that's how we've got on that list but we're in the squad now and we're looking forward to that FIFA visit next year. You are of course a very young club as you've just said and there'll be lots of older clubs who will say why them and why not us. Uh, why do you think it is that Milton Keynes Dons have done so well in this case? Well, as I say, Stuart, I think it is because of the quality of the bid. And, and if you take the, 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 the other things about football away, the fact that we are new, and you just look at what we're putting on the table. And at the end of the day, remember, it's about supporting the England bid. And we've gone very regional with our bid. I'm proud to say that Norwich and Ipswich, um, you know, Northampton Town, Russian and Diamonds, all of these um, clubs in our region are all going to be involved in our bid as well. So it's not just about Milton Keynes, but I'm very proud that in Milton Keynes we're being able to keep the focus and, as I say, make sure that we can get some certainty in delivery. And that really will be the key. Pete Winkleman, congratulations. Thank you very much for being with us. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Stuart. After an eight-year battle with the local education authority in Bedfordshire, a boy with Asperger's syndrome is to be allowed to stay at a special school. Robbie Irons lives in Dunstable and the cost of the school is £130,000 a year. This is Southland School in Hampshire. It was one of the first and remains one of the few boarding schools for children with Asperger's. And it was here that Robbie Irons was sent after his family battled the LEA at Tribunal. I've made friends with a lot of people. I've made so many friends, I've just lost count now. Robbie was first excluded age five. Prone to violent outbursts, he was put in a special unit but kept running away. When Look East first interviewed Robbie, he'd been out of school for more than a year. When I was running, in my head was just, just white noise, really. I couldn't feel anything, couldn't hear anything. And when I actually got there, I was like, what have I done? And I thought... I've just done the most stupid thing that someone my age could ever do. His mum felt he was no longer safe and so began her long and costly fight. <laughs> Robbie came to Southlands exactly a year ago. I believe Robbie does want to learn. I believe all these boys want to learn things. It's finding the mechanism that makes them tick, that will, will stimulate them to want to actually access the classroom and to learn and to work with all the staff and therapists at Southlands. And I think that's what um, 
the money buys and the long-term payoff will be Robbie, will be a much more valuable member of society later on. But unknown to Robbie, the LEA was fighting on. His mum was at her wit's end. It's not like I've just decided that's what I want and that's what he's going to have. It's like I've tried everything else. I've tried every other possibility that I can possibly try and he will then become an adult that has no qualifications, can't go to work, hasn't got the skills to be able to go out into the world and they'll end up paying for him anyway. The council declined to comment to Look East but in a letter to the family's solicitor said it remains of the view that it can meet Robbie's needs locally but recognises his stability is important at this time. Whatever the reasoning, Robbie needs to make the most of this valuable time. Nikki Jenkins, BBC Look East.